Good evening and welcome to Peace IT's session. Our webinar this week is on CompTIA's Exam 220-80, actually that's 220-802, Objectives 1.7 and 1.1. The objectives this evening are covering maintenance procedures and basic operating system security settings. Good evening, Gabriella, and welcome to tonight's webinar. If you have any questions, go ahead and jump in. We've just got started. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to maintenance procedures. The objective that this is under is 1.7 of the 220-802 exam. And we begin this objective by talking about what a best practice is. And a best practice is a technique or methodology that consistently results in a superior outcome over a different technique or methodology. And best practices can be standardized across an industry, an organization, or an individual. I have some best practices that I employ uh, that are very specific to me. One of them being that I get up at the same time every day. Uh, just because that helps me to function better throughout the day. So that would be a best practice for me. But there are best practices that are out there, and we're going to discuss some of them as far as maintenance procedures go. Items or things that can influence best practice. Your best practices are the technology that's involved, uh, the policy where you work. Complexity of the system can also affect your best practices. Usage patterns. So if you have uh, peak times where people are very busy with their PCs or on the network, that's not when, when you want to be doing maintenance. There are also network constraints that can affect your best practices. Also, access to other resources have an effect on what best practices you employ. So some of the maintenance best maintenance procedure best practices uh, that we're going to discuss tonight. The first one is backups. You should have your backups scheduled, and they should occur on the scheduled time, and that schedule should be consistent. Uh, once the backups have occurred, you should have a policy for checking the integrity of your backup because there's nothing worse than going than having a system failure and then going to load a backup only to find out that your backup is no good. So you, the best practices for backups is to have them scheduled and to test for the integrity of the backup. Check disk. You should also have a policy on running check disk. Uh, the modern operating system is thoroughly adept at recognizing when system disk errors have occurred, uh, but it is still a good idea to have a scheduled check disk scan in place, anyways. It's better to catch that error early than to wait for a failure to occur. Another maintenance procedure that should have a schedule is defragmentation for spinning disk hard drives. This is only with spinning disk hard drives. A solid state you don't need to worry about fragmentation or defragmenting them. But since most of us are still running spinning platter, you should have this on a regular schedule. So let's move on. Windows update. 
best practice here is to run Windows Update at least weekly, if not daily. Uh, the best practice for this if you're dealing in a large organization is to actually stagger the times that they check to, to deal with your bandwidth, uh, your network bandwidth, but they do need to be scheduled regularly. Now let's talk about drivers and firmware. Uh, first off, you should check periodically to see if there are driver updates uh, and or firmware updates and then check and see what functionality these new drivers or firmware can, can provide. If they don't provide uh, functionality that you really need, then your best practice should be not to update them. If everything's running smooth, don't worry about doing a driver or firmware update if you don't need that functionality. And the reason for that is, particularly as far as firmware goes, if you are doing an update just because it's there and something goes wrong, they can be awfully hard to recover from. It's easier nowadays than it was in the past, but they're still, they still can be rather difficult to recover from. You should have a policy that every PC is protected by antivirus and that your uh, antivirus software is updated daily. It, this is one case where it should be kept as current as possible and you don't have to worry too much about testing things before they go into play. Now let's talk about patches and patches best practices. So a patch is an update to an operating system or application. A patch is used to fix a security issue or a known defect. And keeping your systems patched is a good way to reduce your uh, security risk exposure. But there are some things to keep in mind. And one of those things that you need to keep in mind is that in a production setting, patches can not only fix problems, but they can also produce problems. So whenever possible, when you're, when you're dealing with a system that needs to be patched, your best practice should be to test it on a duplicate machine that is out of band. Uh, in other words, it's not in the production setting and to test it as thoroughly as possible before deploying the patch to a production machine, a machine that's in operation daily. And even then, even then, once you've tested it on an out-of-band machine, so now you're ready to deploy it on production machines after you, after you deploy it, you need to thoroughly test the system to ensure that that patch did not introduce a new problem. Uh, there's nothing quite as stressful as testing a patch, thinking it's good to go, deploying it into a production machine and walking away and then 15, 20 minutes later having a user call you to tell you that some application that they rely upon has been negatively affected by the patch. So now let's talk about some tools that you can use to put these best practices into place. And the first one we're going to talk about uh, is backups. Now Windows XP, Vista, and 7 all have backup utilities. Uh, the Windows XP backup utility, you can reach it by clicking Start, then clicking All Programs, then Accessories, then System Tools, then Backup. Once you get to that utility, you can follow the wizard to either back up your machine or to restore your machine. 
if you're setting up the schedule, the wizard makes it very easy to select which files that you want to back up. And in Windows XP, your backups can be either local, that means on the machine that you're scheduling it, or they can be put onto removable media, uh, DVDs or a tape drive. Now, in Windows Vista, they introduce the Backup and Restore Center, and it actually gives you more options on how and where you can back up. In this particular case, it introduced the ability to back up to a network drive, which is honestly a godsend given the amount of da data that PCs keep nowadays. To get to the backup and restore center, that is available from the control panel. There's also a utility called System Restore. It's a quasi backup, but not really. Now, System Restore will return the PC to an earlier state if it has become unstable. Hopefully, your restore point is a stable state. And why would you need that? Well, a lot of the times when you update drivers or download patches, it introduces an instability into the operating system or an application, and you want to return your system back to that earlier state, that's when you use System Restore. In Windows XP, you get there by going, clicking on the Start, going to All Programs, clicking on Accessories, System Tools, and then on System Restores, and that gets you to your available restore points. Now, starting in Windows XP, uh, Windows created automatic restore points every seven days, but it also created restore points after certain events take place. In particular, Windows Update. So when it started downloading those Windows updates, it created a restore point so that you can get that system back to the point that it was before the Windows update occurred. In Windows Vista and 7, the system restore is available from the control panel. So once you get there, you click on the system utility, and then system protection, and then system restore. Now let's move on to check disk. Um, so like I said earlier, Windows operating system can automatically detect some disk errors. And when it does that, what it'll do is the next time you reboot the PC, it will automatically run check disk. Uh, check disk can mark bad drive sectors. And when it does that, you can also set it so that it will try to restore or recover those bad se sector sectors. Uh, check disk can also recover some system files automatically. You can also run check disk manually. And the way that you do that is you, from Windows Explorer, you right click on the disk or volume that you want the check disk to occur, select properties, tools, error checking, and then you get to select the desired options. Now, as a best, best practice, you might actually want to schedule uh, check this to run weekly or every other week or once a month on the machine. And you can do that from the control panel and the system utility, at least in Windows Vista and 7. And you go to the scheduling tab, and you can schedule check this to run. Now we're going to talk about uh, defrag. Uh, and why do you want to defrag spinning disks? Well, because as, as fragment, fragmented disks are less efficient. And as the operating system and the PC runs, files become fragmented over time. In Windows XP, the defrag was available from computer management and defrag had to be run manually. You could not schedule 
uh, defrag to be run. Now, with Windows Vista and Windows 7, uh, they both actually automatically schedule defrag to be run on disks. So you don't need to worry about scheduling it. Best practice in this particular case would be to not mess with the schedule. Uh, if for some reason you decided that you wanted to run defrag manually, if you type defrag into the search box, it will bring up the graphic user interface. Now let's talk about recovery images. This is another form of backup. Recovery images can do contain the image of the operating system. They may contain an image of all the installed applications. And they may contain an image of users data. Uh, you get to actually choose which, what gets, what the image contains. In Windows Vista, the image, the way to create an image is to go to the Windows Complete e PC Backup and Restore Utility, which is available from the Backup and Recovery Center. In Windows 7, it has a different name. It's kind of the same utility, but the name is Create a Systems Image, and it is available from the Backup and Restore Utility as well. When you do create the system image, you get to decide what drives get imaged. Now, given the size of my system that I'm currently running, um, I have a 75 gigabyte solid state hard drive that contains my operating system. I have a one terabyte drive and that is about three quarters full, and I have a two terabyte drive that is also about three quarters full. For the most part, when I do my images, I really don't want it to image those large drives, um, at least not completely. I actually choose, pick and choose what I want it to image so that my images, image files are a little bit smaller and so that the task gets done a little bit quicker. Um, the other thing to say about images is that if your PC has a recovery partition, that is usually a system image. That is usually a recovery image, and it's supplied by the, the manufacturer, the original equipment manufacturer, and it does not contain usually any of the user's data. So now let's move on to basic operating system security settings. This is objective 1.8. And the first thing that we get to talk about is users and groups. Uh, Microsoft does use user and group settings as the primary form of authorization to perform tasks. And a user is authorized to perform tasks and functions based on the permissions granted to that user and or to the groups that the user belongs to. Now, each individual user can be granted permissions, but it is common practice to actually assign users to groups and assign permissions and privileges to groups instead of users. And that way, an administrator only has to manage the groups instead of each individual user. But each user can be granted specific permissions. So now let's talk about the different kinds of accounts that there can be or should be. And the first account that we need to talk about is the administrator. An administrator accounts should have complete control of the local machine. And because of this, it is recommended that the administrator account not be the one that you use for daily use. As a rule, you should not be in your administrator account to be checking, just be checking your email and whatnot. 
that is poor practice, uh, you should create a, another lower level account that you as the administrator use for your daily tasks that don't require administrative permissions. Now some other groups that you can, can create and or you can use the templates that Microsoft provides. There are power user accounts. Now these are almost like administrators. Uh, your power user should be trusted and the reason for that is is because that they can install some hardware and some additional drivers and they can change system settings but power users are not allowed to install applications and this prevents the installation of rogue software or malware. Another thing that power users as a general rule are not allowed to do is while they can load some drivers, they cannot delete drivers that have been installed by administrators. This protects your system and your network so that it runs like the administrator designed it to. Your next account, which is a little bit less, is the standard user. Now this is the day-to-day -day user. Uh, they have some trust. The, these users can adjust some local system settings, but they do not have permission to install any hardware, any drivers, or any applications. They don't require that, so they don't get to do it. Then here's your guest account. Uh, this is your most restricted account and when you set this up, you should set this up so that it has very limited functionality. You don't want to give your guests access to mission critical software. About the only thing that you should give them a guest account is access to a web browser so that they can surf the internet and or get to their VPN and their network. Another thing about guest accounts is once your guest logs off, that account should be terminated. You should not have a permanent guest account. Uh, and the reason for that is it's just another hole in the system that you need to keep an eye on. So if you just uh, block it and take it off the local machine, then that's another hole you don't need to worry about. So now let's talk about uh, shared files and folders and the first thing that we got to talk about is administrative shares and local shares. Now administrative shares are a set of default hidden shares that are only available to people in administrative with administrative accounts. They cannot be deleted not even by the administrator but they can be disabled and starting with Windows Vista and Windows 7, that is the default setting and that they are disabled. And the way that you can tell that it's an administrative share is if you're, if you're looking at the share and it has a dollar sign in the name, that means it's an administrative share. And they were um, usually denoted by well, actually, administrative shares included the C drive on most machines, uh, root system folders, and all of those uh, actually system files and folders that are hidden from normal use. Local shares, on the other hand, are shares that are created and they can be made available to anyone and they're usually created on the local machine and shared to others. Now files and folders do have a relationship. The folder that contains files is the parent of the files. Uh, and the file that is held by the folder is the child. Two files that are within the same folder are siblings, 
And just like you and I, the files inherit inherit things from their parent folder. And usually what they inherit are the permissions that are assigned to the folder. Now, the children files can have different permissions than their parent folder, but they have to be explicitly set. If you don't go in and explicitly change the permissions on the file, then it has the permissions of the parent. And what that really means is that if you set the wrong permissions on the folder, they get propagated to every file that that folder contains. So you need to, to keep that in mind when you're viewing or adjusting permissions, that anything downstream inherits from the upstream. Now, system files and folders, these are the ones that contain the operating system and other files that are necessary for the system to function. Now, by default, system files and folders are hidden and protected. You can change that. And the way that you change that is from the folders option applet or utility that's in the control panel. Once you open that utility, you go to view, and then you Click the button that says unhide system files and folders, and now they're unhidden. And actually, you strip some of the protection off. Um, so that's kind of why I also have this caution or warning down here, that if you do unhide them and unprotect them, you may create a security issue. Uh, so do that with some caution or care. Now, there are different kinds of permissions and privileges. Uh, and actually, I guess before we get into that, we need to talk about file attributes. Wow. Um, file attributes. Every file and folder has some basic attributes. These are the first basic set of permissions that get applied. Now, file attributes do work with permissions, but they are also completely separate from permissions, which we will talk about here in just a moment. File attributes will take precedence. That means they come first over permissions, and they will override any permissions that you put on a share. Um, so if your file attribute was read only, that means the operating system prevents anyone from making any changes to that file or folder. And before you could make changes to that file or folder, you would actually need to change the attribute to uh, um, one of the other settings before even an administrator could make changes to that file or folder. Now, if you are moving a file or folder within the local machine, so you're moving it from one place on the C drive to another place on the C drive, any permissions that you have placed on that file or folder get moved right along with it. And now if you are copying or changing the volume location of a file or folder, so you're moving it out of that volume or off of that disk, then whatever permissions are situated on the target location are the permissions that get applied to that file and folder. So now let's talk about permissions. And the first permissions we're going to talk about are NTFS permissions. Now these are permissions that are only available on NTFS drives. That's new technology file system, or is it new technology file structure? Um, these permissions only apply to the local drives. Now, the permissions can be based on the user. Permissions can also be based on group accounts. Uh, you do set the permissions 
explicitly. <clears throat> and when you're dealing with the permissions, the actions are either to allow an action or to, de to deny an action. And if you check both allow and deny, deny overrides every time. The permissions that are available are read, which means that the file can be viewed but not modified. Write, the file can be viewed and written to, and the changes can be saved, but you cannot delete the file. Read and execute. Uh, if you have a program that a user needs to access, then you need to give that user read and execute permissions or else the program won't run. Modify. That means that the user can read, they can write, and they can delete the file or folder. It's still a little bit different than full control. And what full control means is that that user can take ownership of the file or folder. Share permissions are a little bit different. Uh, share this is for when you share a file or folder onto the local network. Uh, there are three basic share permissions. There's read, and that's the default. Every file or folder that is placed in a share gets the read permission by default, or else you wouldn't have shared it if you didn't want people to be able to view it. The next level up is change. That means that it can be read and written to. You can modify the file, cannot delete it. And then there's full control. And that is the same as full control in an NTFS situation. Now shares, share permissions and NTFS permissions, they stack. That means you can have multiple permissions on the same file and folder. And when they stack, they get combined. And the way they get combined is the least restrictive permission from the NTFS setting is compared to the least restrictive setting from the shared permission, which is then those two least restrictive permissions are compared and the most restrictive of the two is the permission that becomes active. That gets a little bit complicated, but that's the way that it works. So if your least restrictive NTFS permission is um, right, and your least restrictive share permission is full control, the two are combined, and the permission that becomes active would be the most restrictive of the two, which would be the right permission. That gets a little bit confusing. Now let's move on. Now that we're done with permissions and their settings, let's talk about user authentication. So authentication is proving who you are. And something to keep in mind because this is another thing that can become confusing every once in a while, is that authentication is not authorization. Authentication is just proving who you are. Once you are authenticated, then you get authorized by uh, the system to perform actions. Now, there are a bunch of ways that you can uh, authenticate. And you can basically break those down into three different things. There's what you know, what you are, and what you have. What you know is the most common user authentication out there. That's username and password. That's what you know. What you are is becoming more and more common. <clears throat> and that's using um, like biometric authentication fingerprint scanners, uh, retinal scans, facial recognition, voice recognition, so on and so forth. Those are what you are. 
tracking are becoming more common, especially as we've seen with Apple and their iOS, um, or their iPhone, excuse me, and, and the new iPads with their finger scanners. And then there is what you have. And what you have is uh, basically it's a security token. That's the most common one. It uses a rolling code, the code, a rolling code logarithm. Every 60 seconds, 60 seconds is usually the, the default. It could be more, it could be less. But every 60 seconds, the screen on the token changes and pops up a new code. When you go to log in, you're asked for that code along with your username and password, usually. And you type in the code. <coughs> And the authentication server happens to know what that code should be at any given time. Uh, security tokens are very beneficial, and they really do help to secure networks. There are ways that they can be uh, beaten, though, and I'll talk about that later. Now, if you combine uh, the different forms of uh, authentication, like I said, with the security token, if you have a user name and password that you need to supply along with the, the code off of the security token, that's called multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is much more secure than single-factor authentication. Uh, you're starting to see that more and more, that occur more and more. Um, which is a good thing because we live a, in a highly unsecure environment and that will definitely help. Another security setting that you should consider is what's called single sign-on. And what that means <clears throat> is that when you as a user sign on to the machine or onto the network, you only need to sign on once you don't need to log in for each and every resource that you need to access. The benefit to this is there's less passwords that you need to remember, less passwords you need to manage, and the less passwords you need to remember and manage, the more likely that you are going to adhere to a stronger password uh, type system. The one drawback to single sign-on is you need to be in a domain type network in order for it to work. If you are in a work group type network, it will not work. So you at least need to be in the domain setting. Now that covered <coughs> all of the objectives <coughs> Of, of the items under Objective 1.7 and 1.8 for CompTIA's exam 220-802. With that, I'm going to end the recording.